Hello, LinkedIn Live audience, and welcome to this month's Live Women in CX panel debate. I'll be your host, Clan Musket, and I'm the very proud founder of Women in CX, the world's first online membership community for women in customer experience. Firstly, today, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to our sponsor of today's panel and all of our digital events in March for Women's History Month. Thank you to Calabrio. Calabrio is a workforce management company whose software empowers contact centers and agents as brand guardians. And you can find out more about them if you visit calabrio.com. But most importantly, I'd love to say hello to all the Calabrio employees out there who are apparently meeting up in a variety of offices around the world to watch this panel today live along with us. Thank you all so much for supporting Women in CX. So before I introduce today's topic and my esteemed guests, I'd love to get the chat started. So audience, please do let us know where in the world are you joining us from today? And whilst we're waiting for a few more people to join, in the background, I'd just like to introduce my amazing team who are supporting this live stream. First of all, we've got Meg, who's coordinating the chat backstage and also Harley supporting you in the chat front stage. So Harley's going to be asking you all the same questions we're going to be asking the panel today. So please, please, please do get involved in sharing your thoughts too. So just to tell you a little bit more about who we are and what we do. Um, two years ago on International Women's Day, Women in CX first launched with a small group of founding members and has since grown into a community of more than 7,000 members, sponsors and supporters across the globe. The goals of our organisation are to promote diversity, equity and inclusion within the CX and tech industry, to create opportunities for women's networking, learning, mentorship and support, and super importantly, to advance the field of customer experience by amplifying the voices of women and nurturing their ideas. And in a space where 70% of the frontline workforce are women, but only 30% make it into entry level management, we've got some serious work to do. If you're wondering a bit more about where it all began, Wix started in the pandemic lockdowns of 2020 as a platform for women to have real talk conversations about customer experience and the issues we face in and out of the workplace. A community sprang up around the show on social media and the response really helped us to identify a market need for something more organized to enable women across the world to connect with and support one another. So we built an online membership community as a safe space for women from diverse backgrounds to come together and support one another and launched officially on International Women's Day in 2021. But since then, we've expanded into an offline community with events and conferences led by our members being held in locations like London, Barcelona, Dubai, Toronto, Dublin, New York, San Francisco, Amsterdam, Saudi Arabia and even the Caribbean. And by harnessing the power of female collaboration, sharing our challenges and experiences and learning from one another, our members are achieving far more together than they ever could alone. But the jewel in our crown is known as the Inner Circle, a private paid members only community platform that we co-designed with our community, a place where women can unite across the globe to collaborate, inspire and support one another on the path to CX mastery. And with access to a private social network, exclusive networking events, guest webinars, member-led masterclasses and case studies, plus a whole resource library of exclusive content to help our members flourish both personally and professionally, this is the place to be if you're looking to accelerate your career. And this year we launched a whole new host of exclusive Inner Circle features, including a mentoring scheme to help women find their dream mentor, a member directory to connect women and subject matter experts who can solve each other's challenges. We have a regular CX news roundup focusing on the latest trends and hot topics and a list of approved coaches to support women with their goals. And our members have been experiencing huge success in connecting inner circle members with opportunities for employed work, consulting, public speaking, content collaborations, and raising their profiles through our own and partner media channels, 
including the Women in CX podcast, CX Today, My Customer and CX Magazine. And you have to come take a look for yourself. Our community is just flooded with success stories of promotions, pay rises, new jobs, new businesses. And with Wix courses opening soon, we can't wait to see what our community members achieve next. So we are open to applications right now. So if you'd like to apply to join the wait list, please check out the link in the comments now. Harley should be posting that because we'd love to see you there. And don't worry, we even offer a social pricing model and free scholarship places for women out of work to ensure all social and economic barriers to taking part are removed in the spirit of true equality. So we're on a mission to amplify the voices of women in our industry, hence taking this, what was previously a roundtable discussion inside the community, live to you, our audience here on LinkedIn today. And just as a reminder, our panel are gonna be discussing from exclusion to inclusion, revolutionizing customer and employee experiences through diversity, equity, and inclusion. So before I introduce my esteemed guests, I'm gonna see who's here. So we've got Lisa France says good day, Aubrey Diaz, welcome. <laughs> Mindu Luke, Victoria, hi. <laughs> I've got Farine in Calgary, Denise in Georgia, Olamawaya in Logos, oh, Nigeria, and Charlotte in Ghana, welcome. Got Swadi in London, hey Swadi. <laughs> Ella in Minneapolis, Lynn in Brussels, wow, Vera in Belgium, <laughs> Audrey in Columbus, Ohio, Isabella in Copenhagen, Denmark, wow proper international audience today. Me in the Philippines, Linda in Chicago, um, Sarah in Minneapolis, Volatito in Scotland, Connie in Philadelphia. Wow, thank you so much for introducing yourselves, ladies. And um, yeah, like just what an awesome turnout today. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, so just to get started, I'm going to introduce um, a bit more context around this panel. And that is that the state of diversity, equity and inclusion or DEI as it's known, is becoming increasingly important in all companies and in all industries. Many organizations are recognizing that creating diverse, equitable and inclusive environments is critical to attracting and retaining both customers and employees. Companies that prioritize DEI are better able to connect with their diverse customer base, understand their needs and preferences and build deeper relationships that can lead to better products performance and business outcomes. But when most organizations are still failing to deliver inclusive product services and experience, why is that? One thing's for sure, there's a clear connection between creating workplaces that are diverse and inclusive and fostering inclusive and equitable design and decision making from the front line to leadership. Diversity is for sure a competitive advantage. But with such little progress being made, Perhaps the more fundamental work to do is to address the systemic barriers and biases that prevent underrepresented groups from participating fully and advancing work in the workplace in the first place. <laughs> Excuse me. To really get under the skin of this topic, today I'm joined by an incredible panel of women from the Women in CX Inner Circle who are leading the way in DEI with their work in championing the recognition of different customer and employee needs and changing the way organizations serve people. Our panelists are going to be sharing insights from across the spectrum of inclusion, sharing their points of view from inclusive research and design for disabled and aging people, global initiatives to include people with non-visible disabilities, leadership of internal employee resource action groups on race, consultancy on recruitment, retention and development of diverse workforces and the provision of DEI education in training. We're gonna be talking about real world examples and sharing practical tips and advice that you can learn from and hopefully take away immediately. And the panelists will also explore the challenges businesses are facing by giving their advice on how to recognize and overcome the typical barriers to creating equity and inclusion. So if you or your business is looking to make CX and EX more inclusive, get set to hear these valuable insights from an epic group of experts. And audience, we'd love you to get involved by commenting in the chat, by asking your questions, because the final 15 minutes today will be dedicated to you getting to ask the panel your biggest burning questions. So please do fire away and we'll do our very, very best to involve you in our conversation today. So without further ado, please welcome on stage RCX Queens, Christine Hemphill, founder and managing director at Open Inclusion, Steen Ringvig marsel founder of Experience Management Consult and Nordic and German regional director for the Hidden Disabilities Sunflower Scheme, Enna Khan, partner and head of CX at Knight Frank, 
Deanna Avis, engagement leader, watch this space, and Crystal Dacuna, president and CEO of the Inside View. Welcome, ladies. Woo. Hello, thank <laughs> you. And I take a breath. How are you all doing today? <laughs> so excited to be yeah. here. Thanks, Claire. <laughs> You're so welcome. So we may as well just jump straight on in here, I think, and kick off with some introductions. So ladies, I'm going to ask you to share a little bit more about who you are, where you're based and how you're connected to the subject of diversity, equity and inclusion. And really importantly, I think we could get the conversation going by you sharing your thoughts on why you think DEI is such an important topic for the CX industry. So I'm just going to go to my right, which will be Christine first. Take it away. Thank you, Claire, and thank you for, for welcoming me to that, such an important conversation with such a wonderful group of women. Um, I'm Christine Hemphill. I'm founder and managing director of Open Inclusion. We're a disability inclusive insight, research um, and design organisation based in the UK, but operating globally. Um, and I come to you today from France. Um, my interest is really how human characteristics of how people think, sense, move and feel varies customer experience and recognizing that sometimes that aligns with identity of disability and sometimes it doesn't but also sometimes that aligns to many other characteristics that are diverse um, and sometimes it doesn't so this beautiful diversity even within one characteristic um, of the D and i uh, space so that's me wonderful introduction thank you so much christine and i'm going to go to the next window which is Steen with her little halo. <laughs> from her yes, my little line. halo. Um, <laughs> thank you. And um, my journey with customer experience kind of started at the same time as my journey with um, discovering that the world wasn't inclusive. So it goes back for me to uh, 96, where I was an exchange student in the USA, and I took some courses in sociology, and at the same time, fell in love with a woman. And so my interest in understanding groups, how they act, why they act, how we interact as groups sort of was born by me starting to study sociology there. And then by the eye-opening experience of basically losing privilege in a way, um, I was of the opinion that the world was a very inclusive space until all of a sudden I found myself saying I have a girlfriend instead of a boyfriend. And um, so experience that, that came along with that sparked my interest for inclusion and, and diversity at the same time as my, as my interest in understanding people and behavior as a whole. Thank you so much for sharing your lived experience alongside with that. So powerful. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to go down to the next box, which is Enna. Please, if you don't mind introducing yourself, where you're from, what you do and your connection with this very important topic. Thank you, Claire. So I am Enna, and it's really great to be here with all of you today. I head up the customer experience for Knight Frank. For anyone who doesn't know, Knight Frank is a global property firm, but I work in the UK residential side of the business. I'm based in London, and I'm also co-chair of the Race and Faith Group here at Knight Frank. And I joined the Race and Faith Group about two years ago, and my ambition there really was to move from someone who was saying why don't we change this to someone who was saying we're going to change this and I'm going to be part of that um, so I'm really happy to be here and two areas that I'm really passionate about and I'm excited to learn from our fellow panelists well, wonderful. Thank you so much. And love that, you know, not just talking about it, being about it and creating action uh, with that resource group. So thank you. Um, and next we've got Diana. Hello. Thank you for having me here. Uh, so I'm Deanna Avis. I am from California, but I'm based just outside of London. And I'm engagement lead at um, Watch This Space. We are a diversity and inclusion consultancy. So my background is in customer experience. I've been in the CX space leading large transformations for over 13 years now. But this year took the step to focus exclusively on diversity and inclusion because I've just found um, it's so essential that basically I feel that CX without diversity and inclusion is blind. 
And we have to ask ourselves which customers we're designing for and how are we designing for them? Um, and so, so that's why I'm in that space. I mean, I care about it as an immigrant, as someone who's experienced it, but not also, not just because of my own experiences, but because I think it's the right thing to do for everybody. So I think it's, um, it's about maintaining that curiosity and an open mind. Love that. Thanks so much, Tiana. And last but definitely not least, Crystal, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so lovely to hear from all of you. Uh, thanks for having me, Claire. Um, my name is Crystal DeCuna, and I'm the Chief Experience Officer at The Inside View. We're a customer experience design firm. We focus on training and development um, with a leadership program that we're really um, best known for. And the reason the leadership program is so best known is because of the foundation of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, practices that are really embedded into the program itself. And so... Um, yeah, as a woman of color, as a born and raised Canadian with East Indian background, my son is uh, half Indian, half African. There is uh, diversity, equity, inclusion conversations are happening every day in our home. Uh, but also, you know, the different dimensions of diversity has really been uh, something that I've been able to teach now for over, uh, I think we're going into my second decade on <laughs> teaching on the topic. So it's something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, and I think the beauty of it is that we are slowly seeing change happen. Um, and so uh, certainly something that we'd like to see uh, on a faster scale, but change is change. And we're really appreciative of, uh, of those, you know, the, the uncomfortable conversations starting to get a little more comfortable. Uh, and I, did I say I'm coming to you from Niagara Falls, Canada? So thanks for my Canadians I see in the chat. Nice to see you all here. And we've got somebody from India as well. Oh, so awesome. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, three. <laughs> I know. And then more people have joined since. Priscilla in Botswana. Um, Sri in India. Um, also Laura in Minnesota. And Teresa from Cameroon. So what a truly awesome global audience that we've got watching along with us today. Um, so to jump into, I suppose, like setting the scene, really, a, a few of you mentioned this topic already, which was, you know, talking about really understanding and embracing the this very different needs and perspectives that different customers and employees have today. So, Christine, I'm going to start with you by asking the killer question. Why does CX fail people with different diverse perspectives and needs today? And could you help the audience by perhaps highlighting some of the most common mistakes business and CX leaders make in, in this. And, and I know having heard you talk about this before, that um, quite often, Crystal mentioned, it's an awkward conversation. Why do so many people shy away from it? Take it away. What a question. Um, let me let me try and do it succinct justice so I can pass to the other community, uh, your panel leads here. I think, the first thing is to recognize design has a problem. Design is not human-centered design. Design is some humans, not all humans equally. And that's because, you know, if you even go one step back and say, there was a point where design was done for designers, then human-centered design came in. It's like, great, let's listen to the people who are actually gonna use the thing, brilliant. And good designers have been doing that forever but that became a real awareness of, hmm, we really need to listen to the people using our solution and put it in their context. And human-centered design became a thing. The thing about human-centered design is it's not yet challenged hard enough in my perspective as to which humans are at the center of that design and which humans are left out. And you know, Diana was mentioning that before, it's really there are privileged perspectives and there are marginalized perspectives today. And they are not resonant of the actual market, of the actual value in the market, of the actual opportunity to create value in people's lives with different characteristics and different contexts, because we just have this historic practice of overlooking certain groups and having in power groups and out of power groups, which of course do change across cultures and across time, but a lot of those groups are represented here today. So really to say the challenge is customer experience today is not designing positive experience for all customers because of historic practices that are really not working effectively for everyone. So the next part of your question is why? Like, 
this is a massive market. It's very commercially valuable. It also lines up with organization values and ability to attract and retain great talent. So why are we making these mistakes over and over? And I think, you know, I often talk about the two biggest blockers, there's many, but the two biggest blockers are fear and complexity. Fear of getting it wrong. So it actually comes from a good place, but is completely, um, if you let fear be a blocker because you worry about getting it wrong and you come from a background that is not marginalised in the way that you're considering, that is taking your privilege and sitting on that comfortably. So that, I think, is, is a really inappropriate way to not want to step in. Just having being brave, having confidence to start and knowing that none of us have got this. None of us know. Even within the space that I'm in and, you know, I'm seen as an expert in disability inclusion, I am constantly learning. So just that starting perspective that none of us have got this, we're all getting this and we're all getting this at different points. And the only way we can get this is just by stepping in and asking openly who might be missing out today, how might they be missing out and how could I do better in my role, whether it's in the insight side of it or the design side of it, so that we can create more consistent experiences that work across more personal characteristics and different contexts. That's going to be valuable to you as a, a designer or an insight generator. It's very valuable to the organisation you're working with. And of course, it's valuable to the community. I'm going to leave this plenty more in there, but I'm going to be quiet and pass to someone else. Yeah, Hila. Steen, go. <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> Unmute. There You're we go. <laughs> now I'm off mute. Thank you for that. Um, yes, you mentioned fear and complexity as some of the reasons, but to be honest, I also think um, blindness and ignorance is part of it. Like I just said, you know, I came from having that discover it at one point in my life that, you know, um, when you lose privilege in some ways, the world kind of looks different. And that, that has helped me understand better what that looks like for people with different types of um, being on the outskirts of the power, if you will. So I really think that a lot of the lack of inclusion in many cases simply come from the lack of knowledge that, that non-inclusion exists because you're at you're, at, you're sitting at a table that is basically yours and you can't see that other side of the table unless, you know, you really want to be aware of it. And the reality is most of those positions of power and tables are occupied by people who look very similar to one another, right? So middle-aged, male, right. white, cis, straight men. Um, and that... Um, difficulty in being able to appreciate what you've never experienced yeah i think it's like one of the blockers of privilege isn't it and i think christine you, you gave me a wonderful quote the other day by Brené brown saying privilege is the opportunity well the, the thing that means you don't have to get involved in difficult conversations and can just avoid it right um so has anyone else got kind of anything they want to throw into that as to like how, why this exists and, and how it manifests i could add one thing is um, I had a conversation at one point with um, a manager in a quite um, high position about inclusion and diversity, and, and we were talking about it, and it was stated, well, we don't have a problem with inclusion and diversity because we have so many nationalities employed. And I said, yeah, but have we ever talked to them to know whether they feel included, whether they feel you know, that there is actually a space for them, or are they wearing a work persona when they come to work? Because I'd been working seven years in the same organization, and I said, nobody ever asked me as someone from the LGBTQIA plus community, how has my work experience been? Have I felt, you know, that there was access and was I included? Um, so it's just the knowledge even of that conversation maybe needing to just happen, that question just having to be asked. Um, mm -hmm that that you know that knowledge just isn't necessarily present yeah that's a really good point and so sorry i was just going to do add to that stina i think that 
you know, Matthew Sayed in his book Rebel Ideas, which I can strongly recommend, you know, talking about different perspectives and talks about blind spots and blind spots by their very nature are blind. So just to really um, reinforce your point there, Shina, that it's very hard to see what you don't know you're missing. And the easiest way to start to understand is by looking to your own workforce and saying who has the lived experience that can unpick this problem in a deeper and more informed way and then to look to your customer base and do the same and your workforce might not be diverse enough so you know to bring in people that can support you and also to look to your customers to tell you and to really ask about you know be courageous and ask about their different characteristics that you can then start to align with different experiences and start to see the patterns of exclusion across an organization. Nice. Nice. So thinking about this kind of where exclusion starts then. So we mentioned kind of being blinded by our own privilege as an example or the lack of diversity and representation and leadership. Crystal, I was going to ask you like what are your thoughts on where the problem of, of exclusion actually begins from your point of view? Yeah, thank you. I, you know, to seeing in Christina's point, Christine's point, um, you know, there's this fear, this underlying fear that um, that I don't know that we're going to get away with, remove completely. But I think a, a lot of it is, you know, feel the fear and do it anyways, right? Feel the fear and do it anyways. But also when you look at just your daily to do list, right, your daily to do list that you might have a million things on your daily to do list. We only get through our top one, two or three. Yes. Right, We only get through such a small portion of them. And when I relate that to diversity, equity, and inclusion, can we just start with a list of three things? Can we just start with those, you know, three tactical things? And maybe that tactical thing is having a conversation with your team, having a conversation with your customers. I think one of the the big things when it comes to, um, you know, making change is that, yes, there's fear, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what I'm even supposed to do. Where do I start? There's so much to do. Um, and so that kind of puts up a, a, a definite barrier. But, you know, engaging help. The reality is there's tons of people out to help. So uh, engaging that help. But like any great business project or any great launch, maybe you're launching a new product or new service, you invest time, money and resources into it. Yes. Right. We all invest those things. Um, and so for some reason, diversity, equity and inclusion, uh, you know, it's making progress in, in some organizations, but not enough. You know, not enough organizations are it's not just about investing money and doing trainings, which, hey, I'm a trainer and I love it. But but it's really about making sure that uh, it's about changing the mindset. It's about investing the resources and the time um, and the real, you know, commitment to making a change in the organization and and organizations need to be able to see the value in the change like what is it going to what's in it for me what's in it for me to change and what's in it for me to put this type of time money and resources towards a project like this and just ask any one of our panelists and we'll be able to give you a laundry list of what's in it for you <laughs> um but um but yeah I, I don't know if i answered your question claire i kind of <laughs> that, that, that was that was a great answer i'm, I'm just thinking like diana's working kind of at the cutting edge of this with lots of clients who are currently trying to understand where they are right now with diversity and equity and inclusion so Diana I like, would love to ask your point of view on the same question but also like what are the ways in which organizations can assess where they're starting from perhaps in a more objective way than just opinion based um, from a leadership table yeah, certainly. So, I mean, assessing diversity and inclusion, I think, is similar to mapping a customer journey, but you're looking at it through a specific lens. So you're basically looking at your inclusion journey. So from end to end, I, I think it's sensible to start with the employees because they're the people who are delivering the experiences. Although, of course, the customer comes into it. But I would say, like, first of all, start off with look at how are you recruiting? You know, who are you um, attracting? What? How flexible is the working that you're offering? And who is that including or excluding, because quite often when we have inflexible working, that's excluding, um, you know, caretakers who are primarily women or people, you know, with disabilities or mental health conditions and, and various other things. So it's it's really, it is quite specialized. Um, I think you have to look at the whole end to end. You can't look at one piece in isolation and say, yep, we've done d because we've given this person a project. You have to look at all of your processes, your communications and the way it all fits together through an inclusion lens. Um, and of course, if you want help with that, um, there's people like Watch This Space, and I'm sure a lot of other awesome consultancies doing that work. 
Awesome. Um, and Anne's just, <laughs> see, it's a nice plug there, Diana. Anne's <laughs> awesome saying, I believe it starts at the top of an organization. If you can get one executive to help champion the voice of DEI, it makes all the difference in my experience. I know um, a super large retailer that I worked for made one of each of the C suite a representative for each of the different facets of inclusion. And that was super powerful to have a board member steering the action around um, inclusion. Um, so yeah, I think in like just t turning that to kind of what can organizations do in terms of empowering these groups or, um, individuals to make a difference. So I was going to go to you, Anna, and, and talk a little bit more about how we can actively employ, uh, actively involve employees in diversity and equity and inclusion at an organizational level. I know you've been championing, um, the chair, steering and chair, chairwomanship, chairmanship chairpersonship of uh, the uh, race and faith group. I would just love to hear a little bit more about that and how you think um, groups like that can be more than just performative and contribute to a culture of inclusion. Thank you, Claire. Um, so for us at Night Frank, we are very much um, still learning. Um, I loved what you said, Christine, earlier about us all you know, we're still learning, we're going through this journey of trying to understand how this works and not one size will fit all. Um, so I took on this co-chair role about two years ago. I didn't have any experience within DE&I at all. And it was all through my lived experiences that, um, that I was um, being pushed into this area. Um, at Night Frank, we have done a lot of things to try and involve our employees and um, that's been important in understanding the uh, perception at the top level of the business and then the reality for our people and their lived experiences. Um, in terms of getting people across our business to be involved, we have four employee resource groups at Night Frank and they cover race and faith where I'm the co-chair gender, LGBT+, plus, and then health and well-being. And each of those groups are co-chaired by individuals from different areas of our business, and then they have groups, allies. And within those ally groups, we have a range of different people from across our UK business. Um, and they're in different roles, different locations, etc. So we're trying to get a, a representative voice from across our business, which I think is really important. Um, we've done lots of different things. So, for example, we have run safe space workshops, roundtables, surveys, our ally group meetings, reverse mentoring. And I think it's all about learning, taking on what our people are saying, and importantly, trying to address their feedback. Mm. Because, you know, there can be um, feedback fatigue, which is not what we want. So we're trying to take action where we can. I think we do have a challenge within our business. Um, you know, Deanna, I love what you were saying about the inclusion journey, and mapping it out. I think that for us, it has been a challenge to understand where to prioritize different initiatives because we want to make sure, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can for our people. Um, so that is something that we need to try and um, figure out as we move forward. But what, what is nice about the way that we work is, is that we're doing it in a collaborative way and we're trying to, I think, learn from each other and grow together uh which is is really important for me and this has just come to my mind um based on some posts i was scrolling through actually on linkedin earlier which is this kind of performative allyship question isn't it that oh we're sticking erg in a resource group that means we've ticked a box that means our employees are represented but actually nothing is changing and it's if, if anything just reinforcing some of the um, systemic levels of um, bias and discrimination, but putting a hat on it and saying we've got that, so therefore we're okay. Um, and I'm seeing this like movement towards like anti-hate kind of groups or, or like cultures where you know we're actively being anti-racist <laughs> as opposed to we're trying to be more inclusive. Does anyone have any thoughts on kind of the difference <laughs> between those things? 
Can I just say something, Claire, there? So performative allyship, I think, is a really interesting area. I think that there will be people, of course, who will be performative. Um, you know, we're, collectively as a business, we're going on this, you know, we're trying to move forward. And I think that um, it's about raising awareness. So things like reverse mentoring, really important. Um, I think that there'll always be people who will say that they're an ally, but actually the action isn't there. And so it is all about, you know, what are we doing to really, really make a difference? And for me, um, I, you know, I saw this in action over the weekend. So a senior partner sent me an invitation to an event, um, a d &I event, which, you know, that wouldn't have happened, you know, two years ago. Um, so I think it's, I think this is happening because as a culture, you know, value the individual is one of our values. So um, we're moving together with our values. We don't always get it right. But um, the point I'm trying to make is that we are, um, you know, calling out, you know, if something isn't actually working, it's about saying this isn't working and actually challenging the business as well to say we're not making a difference here. Why aren't we making a difference here and what are we going to do about it? So it does take a bit of, I think, getting out of your comfort zone and having those uncomfortable conversations as we've, as we've spoken about. But it being, but, you know, ha being constructive as well and not always having an answer, but together coming up with what's the next step. And it can just be incremental steps, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, moving forward yeah no t totally agree and that's why you're on this panel because we know you are doing a really great job and like frank are making the difference i guess i was just trying to say um that there's like so much kind of virtue signaling and doing dei initiatives that aren't for a genuine and sincere reason of action and change um i just wanted to touch on that briefly and i think a few people put their hand up and i couldn't say who but so diana christine um so diana first and then christine will come back to you yeah, so so having also run employee resource groups and all of that, I mean, some things that I've seen work well and not so well, I think that quite often the people who are marginalized are expected to take on extra work and the burden of fixing the issues. And then the senior people think, yep, we've solved that. And they don't have any skin in the game. They haven't dedicated any resource or budget to it. And that is just hypocrisy. And that's putting more burden on the people who need it the least. So if you're going to do that properly, people need to be given the time, the space, the budget to do that work. Um, and also similar to the battles that we face in CX, where we know that we need senior support and it can't just be delegated to someone. We need people at the top. We need the CEO to have this and to be accountable for it. And they are the ones that will be responsible for clearing those blockers and will be like handling it. So it can't be delegated. They have to have skin in the game. Can yeah. I just add something to that as well? I think, Deanna, all those points are really important. And, and we've seen that too here. You know, we have had people who have felt overwhelmed by their roles. Um, and so, we, you know, we are looking at that. But just one element to add to the list that you provided, Deanna, I do also think that there's an element where we do need that expertise too, because, you know, we are within um, our ERG groups, um, enthusiastic um, but we're not experts. So, you know, that, that expertise, I think, is really important to, to, to get that to help um, really understand how to make the biggest differences for our people. And Christine, you said you had something to add? Yeah, just to add to that, I think a couple of things. Firstly, on allyship, that, that what is the role of an ally? And I think the first thing that an ally can do is make space. You know, it's not to take space, it's to make space. Mm. What's important when you make space is to consider which space. And are you just making space for the sake of making space or are you making space to share power, to share decisions, to share essentially the lack of knowledge you have of your business as a leader that is really re re relevant and resonant to your employees and your customers. So there's a level of vulnerability in that making space. And then there's a level of sharing power, not just sharing voice. And I see, you know, we work across a lot of very large companies, many of which have ERGs, many of which have allies working actively in different roles. And those that I see being the most powerful 
are those that voices are not at the fore. They've just made space for other people's voices to come to the fore. So I think you know that to me is what good allyship is. And an ERG, just to be very conscious of an ERG is not representative of that community. It is representative of a subset of that community. The subset of people that are prepared to come forward, the subset, as Deanna said, of people that have spare space, mental energy, time, um, even if it's paid for, for some people that might not be somewhere that they've you know that they've got time and energy to go into. So to always recognise, and of course within disability and within a number of marginalised characteristics, it's up to the individual in many cases whether they choose to share or not share, because 80% of disability is non-visible. So it's up to the employee whether they choose to share or not share their access needs with their employer. And so it's only ever going to represent a subset. So not to think that that group is representative of that need. It is people that have lived experience that is very important to help you understand that broader group, but it is always only a limited subset of that group. Awesome. Okay, so, oh, and Crystal, go on, quick one. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. I know you've got lots of questions to get through. <laughs> yeah, no, sure. Do you want to chime in quickly, though? Yeah, I, it, there's just so much when it comes to, uh, to, to, to support Christina and Anna's point. When we're talking about checking that box, I'm kind of going back a, a few questions here. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of organizations, you know, it's I've got the world leaders in banking, for example. We've got I see this happen so often. Um, they've checked the box with that 30-minute training. 30 minutes of training and they've checked the box and you think of, um, you know, that that's just not acceptable to be able to even understand some basic definitions, basic terminologies, the difference between unconscious bias, conscious bias, target identities, agent identities, the basic terminologies and foundation, even at uh, you're mentioning ARGs, I had somebody bring up uh, the other day, they didn't know what an ARG is. And so they're associate resource groups that are made up of different dimensions of diversity, but this basic understanding that is basic for us but not for everybody else because that's not what they practice on a day in and day out. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the trainings I do, like the basic training is a three to four hour training uh, up until 16 hours of trainings. And then we do trainings every single month to support it. And so it's not a conversation that can just happen in a 30 minute um, 30, I mean, look at our conversation today. We've, we've barely touched on things and we were already, you know, 40 minutes in. So I think it's important for, for people to understand, for, for organizations to know, uh, to Deanna's point, it's about investing that the resources, the time, uh, not just saying this is an expense, but really, you know, what is the ROI on this and how can we really make sure that it's, because um, it, it's exponential. It's quite frankly priceless. You know, you've got companies that are struggling with hiring staff, you know, low sales. Uh, low employee engagement, high turnover. I mean, it's it's all related. <laughs> it's all related to creating a sense of belonging and inclusion within an, within an organization. You know, if, if you're being, um, it's one thing to be invited to, to the dance, but it's another thing to be asked to dance. I know you've heard me say that before, um, but it really is. It, it, you know, being asked to dance and being asked to be involved is something that's so critical. Um, so, uh, you know, the people that are in the organization that are, you know, typically that token person of color or that person with a, you know, visible disability uh, or neurodiversity, that person is always being asked to champion. And it, it is absolutely uh, the most challenging thing because then they're on this island. We've literally put them on an island so that they have mm -hmm. to go champion for things themselves. So my two cents. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for giving me that. No, <laughs> no, and uh, that was actually a question was around the ROI of investing in employees um, specifically. So you kind of answered that, but there was another part to the question I was going to ask, which was so much of this, the work in training seems to center around feeling empathy for mm. people who are different to you. And I think I'm coming to realize that it, well, in fact, I'm not going to put my opinion in here. I'm going to ask you guys, do you think it's actually even possible to empathize with people if you haven't had that lived experience? This is a question for customer experience as much as it is for inclusion. I'm happy to I'll start on that one because, yeah, Claire, I'm actually, as you know, I was talking about it last week and I'm actually doing a, a talk on empathy tomorrow. I think empathy is really flawed as a concept because it says that I can feel like you can. What arrogance. I can't feel like any of my esteemed you know, panellists here today can because I haven't had the experience, the life, 
the, the journey that you have. So it's not to feel like someone else and therefore to know through their perspective, to be in their shoes. I can't get in your shoes. I don't have the right size feet. What I can do is what I talk about is to walk with. I can walk alongside someone and I can ask open and curious questions that are constrained around the curiosity that I can design and change for. So you can, again, it's that idea of making space for people to share what is relevant to the environment you're designing for, whether that's a workplace environment or a customer experience environment. And not to have, not to hold yourself actually to the unreasonable expectation that somehow we can feel like other people. I don't think we can, but I think we can ask and learn and listen really openly and in a way that is informative of the outcome. And then to check back in, this is what I heard, is that what you meant? Because sometimes once filtered through our experience, we can actually filter out the most important things. So we actually, when we're doing our customer experience research, we both co-design it at the beginning with people with different lived experiences of disability. But then we also check in once we've taken the synthesis and understanding out of it, did we hear right and did we take away the understanding that was meant? Or have we somehow got it a bit messed up and skewed up on the way? <laughs> yeah, and the audience are getting quite excited about this concept of empathy. So audience, please tell us do you, what, you, what do you think? And I'm saying here that empathy is not enough. Uh, what are your thoughts on empathy? Audience, let us know in the comments. So I'm going to just skip us on because I realise the time. We're like running out. Audience, get ready of your questions. Is there anything you'd love to ask the panel? Um, but next, we're going to just jump into one of my favourite terms coined by Steen, the nitty gritties of customer experience. Um, what can we actually do practically? Now, this will be great for our audience to hear your practical tips and advice on how do you actually go about creating an inclusive customer and employee experience. Tell us practical example, Steen, the nitty gritty woman, the original. Go first. <laughs> so Christine just talked about you can try to walk with someone and see things from their perspective. So um, I had to implement some disability awareness training in the Copenhagen airport. And I knew I didn't want me and a PowerPoint saying what to do. Um, and so what I did set out to do was interview um, people with uh, an array of different types of disabilities and have them talk me through what is it to go through the airport environment with the challenges that you face. And um, this became little videos that allowed all our staff members to actually see how anxiety provoking or difficult it can be to navigate the airport space when you have different types of both visible and invisible disabilities. So many of the people I talked with said, I would just so wish that people could tell when they saw me because I live with the um, disability that I have, but I also live with the shaming that I endure when people don't understand my needs or um, don't understand that my behavior um, maybe v varies from, from that of other people. And, and that spiked this sort of realization in me that, um, um, and this came from me watching a video um, in Gatwick Airport where the hidden disability sunflower is from, where a young guy said, um, you know, I always order burger, even though I really don't like burgers, but it's the word that I can say um, without stuttering and um, having anxiety from other people trying to say the words for me, other people laughing or people getting impatient because I'm slower. Um, so, so, so from people saying we wish that people could just tell, we implemented the hidden disability sunflower in Copenhagen airport and I at the time had had no sort of prior knowledge of of hidden disabilities, or I have no past in the hidden disabilities community, organizations, or whatsoever. But what happened was really that this oh, very specific, like you said, nitty gritty thing people can wear when they felt the need for um, time, patience, and and extra help. Um, it helped on the passenger side, but what was really surprising was how many employees after we had that training, came out and said, you know, you, there was a guy, for instance, from security saying to me, you have no idea what you started. Sit down, I want to have lunch with you and tell you what this sunflower can do. And he shared that he had been working in the airport for 19 years without ever sharing with a living soul that he has ADHD and is dyslexic. 
Um, but after introducing that training and having all his colleagues sort of walk in the shoes of or walk next to those shoes and see um, what life can look like from a different perspective. He said everybody started sharing their story or the story of their spouses or their children that had something invisible that people can't see. And so he said, so today is the first time in 19 years that I go to work as myself without wearing a mask, trying to pretend I'm something that I'm not. And so that's I mean, it's not, it doesn't solve all this um, diversity and inclusion um, issues in any way, but it solved something and it started a conversation internally that I had not anticipated when introducing this. I was thinking, you know, this is something that is with the passengers out there, but obviously it was also something that sparked an, a, a huge conversation on the inside. So it's like a specific thing that started a conversation um, by 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 basically letting all employees walk next to the shoes of somebody that told them what is it like to be in an airport with whichever disability I I have. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Like creatively handing the mic over for someone to share what their experience is um, through those videos, meaning it made it real for everybody to know. And, you know, not just a persona or a pen portrait, but somebody actually talking about this is what it feels like for me to navigate this. You wouldn't be able to see that otherwise, would you? Or like, like you said, from a PowerPoint, be able to understand that. Um, so aud audience are waiting for your questions. Haven't got any come up yet. So we've got a few more minutes um, of us talking and we'd love to hand the mic over to you to ask your questions. So I'm just going to throw it out to the panel, really, like what, kind of one piece of advice or takeaway would you give to anyone watching along today about how to include create more inclusive customer employee experiences crystal do you want to go next <laughs> yeah i'm uh, there's there's so such a wide variety of places to start but i think uh, number one depending on the size of your organization and depending on what you're able to you know start with we all have to start somewhere uh but you know i work with a lot of more small medium businesses and um and action is really doable uh quite quite quickly it's quite agile in those environments which is why i love working in those environments um and so when it comes to you know the tools to to really get started um, i love using focus groups to be able to start when when now uh, we're looking at diversity equity and inclusion but but a focus group being done by somebody not from your organization so that we you know when we do it we're able to to listen and hear from an empathetic level um, and from a real emotional standpoint. And we do it with customers uh, and we do it with your employees. And so being able to do those focus groups gives us knowledge far deeper than a survey. Uh, it gives us real feelings. It gives us real scenarios, real situations that they've they faced. Um, and then we're able to, to take those real scenarios and you know, craft some type of education to be able to support that learning journey. Um, so that's one. But even diving a little bit deeper into the hiring process, I think uh, it, it really starts when we're looking at organizations. It starts where, where your people are coming from. Uh, and we're, when we're designing that hiring process, I mean, you've all probably heard of, you know, if there's a, a name on a resume that you can't pronounce, you know, we don't, we don't, they, they fear away from calling that particular name. And so there's lots of ways we can, we can avoid the, the, the low hanging fruit, I'll say, right, the low hanging fruit on how we can be more uh, diverse and inclusive. But even deeper than that is, are we going to places where diverse uh, dimensions of people are, are? So for example, are we just posting everything on Indeed or LinkedIn, which I love LinkedIn, uh, but are we, are we just posting or are we, you know, trying to get into environments where maybe there are people with different dimensions of diversity? Are we posting those jobs and having those conversations and developing those relationships with people from different dimensions of diversity you know for for example um you know here we have um, a large east indian community we now have a large asian community in the niagara region we now uh you know there there's communities starting to form which is beautiful and so because of the the communities that are getting you know we're not we're not necessarily going to those communities and inviting them to the table inviting them to participate inviting them to apply uh, even award ceremonies, we often see, you know, women in business awards or small business awards or any type of award ceremony. Um, I, I just recently went to one. There's 400 people in the room and uh, there was probably three people of, you know, from a visible minority in the room. And so it's not that they didn't just buy the tickets. It's were we even inviting 
did we even get out there to be able to develop those relationships and in an authentic way, right? Not just dropping the seed and saying, come on out, we need some more visible minorities uh, to, to be a part of it. And, and we've seen it. We've seen that happen too. Uh, but really developing those long lasting relationships so people feel comfortable and confident to apply for the jobs, apply for the roles, you know, and, and feel good about it. So that would be my one tip is, is like, let's start taking action to, um, to have a, a, a circle that's your own personal uh, and your professional circle that's more diverse. You know, do you have anybody that, that represents a different dimension of diversity in your own personal circle? Nice, nice. Um, I'd say Alyssa Fishwick just popped in and said she wants to dig more into how to create experiences that are more inclusive. Any other examples from panellists? Uh, Christine, before going back to Deanna again, I know that you've got a perspective on how we can make our current CX practices more inclusive. I'm sure Alyssa would love to hear these ones. <laughs> so to jump in with your um, thoughts and then we'll come back to Deanna. Absolutely Diana. happy to and then I'll pass on to Deanna. Um, that is, that is what we do. So we do really inclusive customer listening and inf informing better solutions that are going to ex have, have a lower exclusion footprint essentially across them. So the first thing is really thinking about how you're getting the customer experience understanding you have today. So procurement, who's coming and doing that if it's being done out of house? Internally, who's doing that if it's in-house? And how much are you ensuring that it's representing all the different diverse characteristics? So do you actually have screeners that says, we'd like to make sure that different characteristics, not just gender, not just socioeconomic, but actually the other characteristics that are regularly under-designed for. And if you really want to design well, over-represent under-designed for characteristics. There is such an opportunity there. Um, particularly the less obvious ones like disability, beliefs and so on, the ones that people don't go to so often because, um, you know, and even then when you ask for, and I'll go back to disability because that's my experience um, of the depth, is don't just say we want 20% of people that live with a disability because that's representative of community. If you're still doing that using a format that is highly exclusive, you're going to get people with very light disabilities and probably quite similar disabilities and not the full breadth of humans again, even within there. So be conscious of the process. The process defines the outcome and the process today is actually very exclusionary. Um, be fair, make sure that people are paid. There's some, some ridiculous thing that because we're working in characteristics that are marginalised, surely you can just come and do this for us for free? No. You don't ask your standard customers to come in and do stuff for free. Don't ask a disabled customer or a customer with another characteristic to do so just because it's good for their community. That's not reasonable. Um, and it's actually getting called out. It's happening quite a lot, but it's getting called out more and more. So it's also a real risk to you. Um, and then the other thing is to just really think about what's that cycle of insight that's coming in informing your product and at which point are you getting which levels of which breadth of information? So make sure that it's early enough, essentially. Don't bring people in with specific characteristics right at the end once you've got the thing out there. The earlier you can bring diverse insights in, the more powerful they'll be, not just to make something a little bit better, to, but to make a better something. Love that. And we've got two minutes left, so we're going to have to go quick fire now. <laughs> Diana, any tips from you? Uh, yeah, I'll keep this really brief. Um, just in terms of what we can do with inclusion, I think it's really important to recognize that good intentions are not enough because I've heard so many people, so say, you know, a white male executive or a white female say like, I really care about LGBTQ people or I really care about disabled people or, you know, whatever. But that... Um, oh, we have to be careful to avoid the savior mentality. We are not saviors. We need to make space and we need to release power and elevate marginalized voices. So our role, if what we can do is help um, call that out, help make space and help challenge others when we see that that's not happening. Well, that's a quarter and a half. Woo, love that. And Anna, <laughs> final thought from you. Um, I, my takeaway today, I love what Di Deanna said about the inclusion journey. So I'm going to go away and have a chat and see what we can do about that. Because I just think it's so important. And Steen was talking about, you know, the transfer from internal to external. 
and that's just great as well so I want to look at that so yeah it's been brilliant thank you well thank you all so much for coming today thank you to everyone listening I think what I've learned is that an hour is just not enough to talk about this so we're going to keep the drum beat going uh, with our content from women in CX community we're going to um, really pick out some of the topics that we've um, highlighted today and go into much greater depth so just thank you so much for your interest in diversity equity and inclusion and customer experience this is not over we have a long way to go and a lot more to discuss so thank you all I hope you have an awesome rest of your week bye for now <laughs> Thank you.